Good evening, everyone. It's Dr. Tofai. Welcome to Hernie Talk Live, our weekly Q&A discussing all things hernia related. I'm your host, Dr. Sharon Tofai, hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Many of you are joining me on Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai or via Zoom. You may also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernie Doc. And as always, at the end of this session, our hour will be uploaded to my YouTube channel. You can watch that and all 109 other um, episodes. So today we have a great guest, Dr. Jeffrey Blotnick. Many of you have been eagerly waiting to hear from him. Um, we've actually heard a lot of uh, emails, like really eager, Jeff. So Dr. Jeffrey Blotnick is from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. He is also a hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist, very talented. You can follow him on Twitter at Jeffrey at Jeff Blotnick. And so please welcome Dr. Blotnick. How are you? Great. I'm great. Thanks for having me. I, I, I feel like I have a high bar to hold up if people are looking forward to, to hearing me talk. So hopefully we can. No, I've literally had, I've literally had emails waiting for you. Like when's this going to happen? <laughs> so this is for real. Perfect. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for coming. I know it's always, um, uh, you know, you're volunteering your time. So I'm very appreciative of that. And, uh, I know that our audience is doing the same. So maybe I can have you first introduce yourself, like where are you in your career? How much hernia surgery do you do? What part of hernia, the hernia world do you enjoy the most? Yeah, so um, so I'm at, as you mentioned, I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I came here straight out of training. And so we've been in St. Louis since 2015. So I'm about seven years into my practice. Um, and as you mentioned, um, I would say 95% of what I do is hernia in one form or another, whether it's yeah. inguinal or incisional um, and, and all different aspects of it. And I think that's what I really like about what I do. I mean, every day is a little bit different. Um, you kind of go in with a plan of knowing what to do, but, but every case has its own unique aspects, whether it's you know, a five-time recurrent or something straightforward. And, and so it, it provides... Um, you know, a challenge and a unique experience every time you step into the operating room. And, and I, and I, what I really like is that you can, um, the vast majority of the time you leave the operating room and you fixed a problem, you know, the patients came in with a problem, you do a good operation and, and they leave with the problem fixed ideally. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I think that's the best part of it. Yeah. I think, um, my, my impressions are weekly session has improved the, kind of press about a hernia surgery, but there's a lot of negative press about it because people who have bad outcomes, which can happen with any operation, are very vocal. Um, and I actually wrote a paper on this where we showed that a lot of the negative interaction is kind of promoted by law firms that are profiting from, from that negative sentiment. But the reality is the majority of, of patients, vast majority of patients are really, really well. And that's always been the case since we were in medical school all the way up to now. And it's a very, it's a high, but, but of course there are complications. And I think part of the problem is like, let's say you have a appendicitis, right? And there's a complication from appendicitis. The average surgeon should know how to handle that. But I feel that the complication with hernia is if it's not a recurrence, there's a lot of other like intricacies that maybe a, the average surgeon maybe is not able to handle this. And that's where the frustration comes with patients. What do you think? No, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, probably similar to you, we see patients who've been to, you know, five, six different surgeons or have had four or five different repairs along the way, and they're frustrated and, yeah. and understandably so. Um, and so, you know, I think with those people, um, with those patients, our goals are always to try and, you know, understand the problem. Uh, and just have an honest discussion, like what, what can we accomplish? What are our goals for, you know, this visit and, and can we accomplish those, whether it's with surgery or with other modalities? Um, and I think that's always a good way to step back from the emotional side of it yeah. and really have uh, an informed discussion about, you know, yes, we're surgeons. Yes, we fix hernias uh, very frequently, but, but there's some things we can do and there's some things we can't. And, and I think just being upfront and honest is really critical. Yeah, I agree. And what I say is, you know, do your research, um, especially if you have a, I always say for any surgery, any procedure, whether it's dental or surgical or whatever, like always get a second opinion. That's just a good way of doing things. I mean, when I buy 
what did I need to buy last week? It was some odd thing my mom wanted me to buy. You know, I did some research on that. I don't know if it's a screwdriver or it was something simple from Amazon. Yep. You know, I did research on that. And I think for surgery, you should do the same. That's a, it can be life altering if things go bad. Yep. Um, and, you know, in the United States, we have the luxury of seeing other doctors. You know, we don't have socialized medicine and you're free to travel wherever you want. And now with telehealth, it's even more accessible. Do you offer telehealth, I assume? We do, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you can be another state potentially. Um, yep. Although state, state to state is diff- difficult in the United States. I do want to say that. Yeah, our, our, uh, we <laughs> have not easy. You have to, we, we have to be licensed in that state to yes, correct. do stuff, but yeah, um, so there's, there's some workarounds. There's workarounds, exactly. So I thought the topic we would choose because you do all different types of hernia repairs would be to kind of discuss uh, the different types of meshes that are out there. Because in your career, since you've been in practice, you've already seen you know, a wide variety of meshes come and go and, and newer types of like families of meshes um, coming. So we have some questions related to that, but um, if you could maybe kind of give like a very brief, you know, what are the different categories of meshes? And then I'll, I'll move into the questions. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think meshes is, is, is a critical point of hernia repair. I mean, it's, it's kind of become um, both a hot button, you know, issue, but something that, as you mentioned at the beginning, we use pretty frequently and the majority of patients do well. But, but as you said, we're learning more and more about mesh, the kind of meshes we use and how we use them that, yeah. that have greatly expanded the options that are available for patients. So at least for me, when I talk to patients about mesh, I kind of lump them into three general categories. And I think okay. that's an important way to think about it. There's the kind of traditional mesh we've known for years and years, which is permanent synthetic mesh. Nowadays, that's typically made of different kinds of plastics and in different manners, but, but it's mesh that's meant to be there forever. Um, the, the next generation that kind of came around was what we call biologic meshes. These are usually made from a biologically derived, you know, tissue, whether that's human skin or porcine skin and, and pretty much every other thing you could imagine along the way. Yeah, I think um, they've had like cow, uh, rabbit, yep. human, yeah, sheep. Compressed liver, yeah, sheep stomach, like yeah. you name it, somebody's <laughs> tried to make a material out of it. And, and yeah. they, you know, I think the intentions for those were really good yeah, in trying to find something that wasn't potentially permanent, something that provided a more natural scaffold, uh, ideally for hernias to, or for the, the repair, you know, kind of cellular ingrowth and stuff like that. Right. Um, where those will end up long-term, I think is to be determined that, you know, I, there's, there's probably some indications for them, but I think it's, like everything in, in medicine and, and life, you know, there's a huge pendulum swing one way or the other, and then kind of finding, you know, where that ultimately um, uh, will, will balance out. Yeah. Um, and then I think the last category is kind of the newest ones that, that are out there, what we kind of call biosynthetics. So they're kind of biologically derived, but still a synthetic material. And and the idea behind that is it has some of the mesh characteristics of the permanent meshes that we used, you know, for decades, uh, but it's still not a permanent material. And so the mesh eventually goes away with time. And I think that will see a similar pendulum swing to, mm-hmm. to kind of all the meshes. And I think we, we learn more every year about which patients and which hernias, you know, benefit from which mesh. Um, and, and not every patient needs mesh, you know, not every patient needs permanent mesh. Um, so I think it's an important discussion to have with your surgeon who you trust, you know, kind of what the benefits of mesh are and, and you know, what are alternatives if there are any for you specifically. That's very true. Um, again, not everyone needs mesh, depends on the hernia and the circumstance. And then not all meshes are created equal and not every patient would need the same exact mesh. So the beauty of it is, I think people like you who are specialists understand the different companies, the different meshes available and can kind of tailor to the needs. Um, I feel that surgeons that, that you know, are general surgeons that don't necessarily have an actual hernia interest, um, you know, they have a mesh that they always use and that's kind of their thing. And usually that's fine, but sometimes um, I think tailoring to the needs of the patient may, may help 
benefit them a little bit more. Um, I was looking at our questions and actually the very first question is exactly this question, which is how has mesh evolved since it was first introduced? Do you want to maybe address that? A little? You already kind of talked about the different families of meshes through the years. Um, but do you think we've actually evolved uh, towards a certain type of mesh or weight of mesh or shape of mesh or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, this can this can get very, very technical very quickly. And, and obviously, we don't want to spend an hour talking about nuances of pore sizes and mesh densities and all those sorts of things. But, but yeah. yeah, I think it, it has evolved some. We've learned a lot about kind of the construct, how it's put together, the, as you mentioned, the weight or how heavy the material is. We know there's different types of coatings and things like that. And I think right. just as much as the the type or the even the brand specifically of mesh that's changed, what, what's changed a lot is how we use it. And I think that's a big advantage for a lot of people is, is we've learned a lot about how to use mesh more safely um, that, that at least in our experience we've seen has been beneficial. So, I mean, yes, mesh has evolved. We've learned I think just as much as we learned what's good about mesh, so those characteristics that are helpful, we've learned ones to try and avoid. Um, unfortunately, that you know takes years before those things are are vetted out, and so you know we continue to try and, and improve the kind of mesh that we use. And, and yes, it's evolved, but but I think we've evolved a lot too as surgeons and how we use it. What are some meshes you think uh, we've moved away from, or techniques we moved away from? Yeah, I think, you know, some of the specific characteristics that we've seen is, um, you know, either like positioning rings, uh, you know, those yeah. got into trouble. It's I think, tough. yeah, I think there's a balance in weight or densities. We've learned you can be too dense, you can be too, too light, um, yeah. and that there's mesh fractures. You know, I think there's been a general shift away from some of the hybrid meshes with different types of synthetic coatings due to some different characteristics and how they shrink and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those I think are, have improved. Uh, and again, that's that's come with, with with time and knowledge. Yeah, I feel that in general, less is more in general. So like back in the day, there was like three layered mesh, right? There was like EPTFE and two layers of polypropylene plus a ring. And um, you put it in laparoscopically and the patient was like, I feel like I have like armor in me. And they kind of almost did, you know, like they couldn't bend, they couldn't be active. I had a construction worker like that. Um, it was just too much mesh and you don't need something that's so thick and so heavy, it's like cardboard being put inside you. Yep. Um, and then we flipped the other way and, and they made it mesh that was so lightweight and so thin that like you said, those mesh fractures, it was actually tear open. The same way that if you wore like a really tight outfit, but it was like thin, like let's say silk or something, it'll just tear. Um, so yeah. Also, I think we're we're moving away from like mesh that's too dense, like like plugs, you know, like a big ball of mesh. We don't think a ball of mesh is good. Maybe a flat mesh is better than anything that's um, has a lot of volume to it, or besides just density. So I I, yeah, I agree with that nothing it's kind of like the goldilocks you know not too tight not too not too heavy not too lightweight but then you know if you have someone who's let's say 500 pounds or whatever the situation is 200 pounds that's going to be a different mesh choice than like a ballerina yep. right yep. agree with me yeah yeah and i think just so yes there's patient characteristics that yeah. that change that i think there's also hernia characteristics so where the hernia yeah. is located right in the belly button is it off on the side is there other associated injuries that we yeah. see yeah um, where we're more reliant on the mesh to be a, a strength layer than just a reinforcement scaffold sort of thing so yeah i mean the, yeah. the patients make a difference the hernias make a difference um, i completely agree with your comment about moving away from plugs or, or big pieces okay. of mesh stuffing them in holes. I mean, back in the day, maybe that made sense, but it's certainly not what I would want on any of my friends or family, that's for sure. Yeah, and that message is slowly making it through, but I still, I think last year it was at Sages, there was a video, was it Sages? I think Sages was a video where they laparoscopically put a plug in and I was like, oh. I had to get up and say something, but I could hear the whole audience say, Ugh. "Yeah, like, how did that get accepted to be presented? Um, as like a novel technique. Um, yeah, uh, I have a patient who, so there's a dilemma because, so he's a smart guy, really bad car accident or maybe motorcycle accident, really bad accident, lucky to be alive. Um, 
anyway, long story short, he now has this huge, like what we call traumatic flank hernia repair. Like the muscle is just completely pulled away and he's missing muscle plus it's pulled away. So there's a intense reconstruction. There's no way I can do it without using something to replace all that missing muscle. So I need mesh. Um, and I, and I have to use a heavier weight mesh because I can't just put in like something super thin, but you know, he's reading and he's like, why can't we do this? You know, tissue repair. I know you do tissue repairs. I'm like, I do, but not for you. <laughs> and okay. I want like a lighter weight mesh. How about a biologic? I'm like, no, like for you, you need like intense surgery. It's very different than someone with like a little hernia or and I think that's Very important. Uh, sorry, I think that's important for patients to, I mean, it's okay to do some research and have some understanding of those sorts of things. And I think it's an important subject to talk to your surgeons about and ask them. And if, you know, if it's somebody who's like, well, this is just the way I do it, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that warrants some further explanation as opposed right. to seeing someone like you or myself who's experts and can can describe why and and you know what the alternatives are or maybe may not be for those types of patients um, I think that's an important thing when picking a surgeon uh, here's another question what are your feelings about anatomically shaped meshes like the 3d max as opposed to flat mesh I think there's some benefits to it you know yeah, the agreed we think about patients you know mesh is a comes in a square most of the time. Yeah. We are we are not squares. Right. Um, and obviously the groin, I think, is a little bit different than the abdominal wall. It's it's a 3D contoured space. Um, yeah. And so I think it's helpful to allow it to, to sit in there a little bit flat. And, and again, not to get too technical, but we know some of the characteristics of why hernias in the groin recur, usually along the inferior edge. And we've seen mm -hmm. some flat meshes when you put them in, as they fold to that contour, they kind of curl up like that yeah. so you can be at risk for recurrence underneath so I, I think I think there's some value in for them uh, especially in the groin yeah the anatomically curved meshes that follow the curve of whatever recreates the anatomy better I think yep. is always is always good all right here's the next question and by the way being technical you're going to see these questions they're pretty intensely like insightful so it's okay to be a little bit more technical Perfect. This audience is amazing. Okay, so here's a question. As you previously said, mesh complications are rare, but when they happen, they can have a high degree of severity and be difficult to fix. Would not classifying all surgical mesh products as class three high risk devices help in diagnosing and managing those complications by introducing and enforcing lifetime monitoring of patients who had mesh implanted? That is a that is a really really good question, and I think right? there's a there's a whole Again, there's a whole spectrum of that question that you can talk about, you know, and that comes from education and knowledge of what's putting in as surgeons, even sometimes we see the surgeons don't even say what they put in, let alone the patients yes. knowing what they put in. Right. Um, so I, I, I think there's definitely value in, in having this long term follow up available where we can have a better understanding of what happens with these meshes. And that's where a lot of the data that we make decisions come from European countries where they have a centralized healthcare system where they can right. follow these patients more long-term. And so we're a little bit behind, you know, in the United States on that one. I, I think the, the biggest barrier here is, is really just the logistics and the challenges of it. It's, it's not to say it's not important, but, but I think the funding and all that sort of stuff is, is always a challenge in anything in healthcare. But, but I think it'd be really helpful for us as researchers and people who study and put mesh in to know what's going on. Yeah. Um, long term. So um, currently in the United States, the FDA approves uh, or clears meshes as a class two um, device. They, they are not currently class three. In the, in the European Union, they, the meshes have now officially, all meshes, hernia meshes included, have been upgraded to a class three or high risk device. And that implies additional research and additional human data and po post-marketing surveillance, which means it meshes in you, but then they have to follow you. And I remember before this became official, because they kind of gave like a two-year warning to the European um, societies, they're like, that's great, but 
who's going to do this? Who's going to follow? Who's going to pay for it? Because it's very expensive to have prospective follow-up. Um, and in Europe, it's now mandated because that two years has gone by um, that no mesh can be sold unless there's human data as opposed to like kind of relying on historical data. That has not happened in the United States yet. And I feel like the FDA is kind of watching to see what happens in Europe to see, you know, how is this affecting hernia care and access? Because for pelvic mesh, different anatomy, different disease process, they have gone from class two to class three. So they re-categorized pelvic meshes to high risk devices. As a result, almost no company even offers pelvic meshes anymore. Maybe that's some people that's a good thing, but you know there are situations where the surgeons have like nothing to, to offer the patients. Um, so I don't know. Do you think do you think they're going to go for it in the U.S.? I think they're they're making some headways in that yeah. even though it hasn't been reclassified, there's more emphasis on long term uh, outcomes. There's more emphasis on kind of patient uh, reports and those sorts of things. So I think we're yeah. we're starting to get there. Yeah. Um, but as you mentioned, who, who's going to do it? Who's going to pay for it? You know, we have trouble and you may be similar, just getting yeah. patients to come back for their one year visit for yeah. us to check how they're doing, even if we schedule yeah. it. And so, um, you know, ultimately, I think patients are a partner in this um, and that we need patients to be engaged and understand, like, I'm asking you to come back so we can know how you're doing. And so we can learn. It's not, I mean, some of it's social. I like to know that you're doing well, um, yeah, but, yeah. but but patients are a partner uh, in this whole experience. So I think that's important. I think we'll, I think we're getting there, but I yeah. think it will take some time. I do think the point you made of, you know, potential that we may end up having less and less manufacturers or companies making mesh um, for, for even hernia repair is, is a potential real yeah. thing. Um, and as you mentioned, there are some patients where mesh is critical to giving them any sort of repair. Um, yeah. And I think that's that's an important thing to keep in mind as we balance the, the whole mesh debate out. Yeah, I think the all or none, like all mesh is evil and kills people and should be banned is a really a disservice. Um, it's like saying, you know, having a bad, we had this debate on Twitter actually the past day or two with um, Eric Pauly and some others. And, you know, he used a, the car analogy. I've used the car analogy before too, like to say that, you know, we, there are issues with cars because you can have car accidents and people die. Um, doesn't mean you should get rid of all cars, right? right? Um, you can have regulations, seat belts, you know, air bags, whatever. Um, better construction or like speed bumps and, you know, speed control. But the same is true for, for products that we use as implants. Um, okay, another question. Can the cut edges of mesh be sharp and cause pain? That's a good question. Um, pain is a hard one. You yeah. know, there's, there's a lot of factors that can or cannot cause pain. And I, I think, you know, to answer that question, can it? Sure, uh, I guess potentially, but but there are a lot of things you need to really sort out and investigate before I would just say, oh yeah, it's the edge of the mesh that's causing pain. Right. I think the kind of mesh that was used, right. um, where it was placed, how long it's been there, what other surgeries have happened. You know, was it you had this pain beforehand and now we still have pain, and so is it the mesh that's actually causing the pain? So I think there's there are a lot of factors in that question that make it hard to say a yes or no answer yeah. um, that there I think you, you really just need to be cautious with. There used to be meshes where you weren't supposed to cut it. Yeah. Um, the, the triple mesh I was talking about, the composite mesh, you, you should not cut it. And, and some surgeons didn't know that and they cut, there was fistulas and so on because you had sharp edges. But um, most of the meshes currently in the market, I'm trying to think of any meshes where you can't cut it. I think almost all of them out there right now you can cut. Yeah, I think there's some of the, the hybrid ones, the biologic synthetic hybrids, um, the way that they're woven together. I think if you cut it, you potentially can undo some of that. But in general, I agree. Yeah. I think we're, we're okay cutting, cutting yeah. meshes. Um, and I think that's also a good feature because um, we know it's kind of thinking back to that plug comment you made before, like where mm -hmm. mesh is folded or, or excess mesh is there. 
um, you know, that, that doesn't ingrow as well as we would like it to. So I, I think it's a good characteristic to have. Yeah, I agree. Uh, here's a patient, uh, two years out from repair, and I still have sharp stabbing pain in my belly button. So it sounds like a belly button hernia repair. And besides it, it's now leaning down and over to the right ovary. What do you think that could be? It makes me gag to puke. And I was in bed all night and all the next day. Other than that, it hurts daily to get very bad. And at times, CT scans and labs are normal. So this is, let's say, a two, let's say two years out for an umbilical hernia repair and they have sharp stabbing pain. That's not normal. No. Right? Um, I, I, I totally agree. That That is a rare, uh, a rare thing. Happens, yes. Um, yes. But, I, but I think that goes back to the whole trying to get a better understanding of what's causing that pain, what's causing those kind of symptoms. Um, and that, that can be hard. You know, there yeah. is not a, a perfect test that, that you just go like, oh, let's go do this scan and it's going to show us exactly what's going on. And, and unfortunately, these situations, especially when it's now two years, it's, it's process of elimination. You, you kind of right. rule out one thing and you say, okay, well, it wasn't this. So we'll, we'll put a laparoscope in and make sure there's no adhesions. Okay. There's no adhesions. And, you know, so, so a lot of these scenarios, um, take some time to sort out and, and I can understand it being frustrated as the patient for sure, when it's completely impacting your quality of life and your daily activities. But, but again, it's not a simple, oh yeah, I'll just go do this operation. It's going to, you know, instantly cure everything. It takes some time. So here's a, a detail. What if no mesh was used for the belly button hernia repair and now they have sharp stabbing pain? Yeah, uh, you know, that that also changes a lot of things. I think in those situations, and even if mesh was used, you know, you want to rule out common sources for pain. You know, did the hernia come back? We know right, that exactly. happened, right? Yeah. Is, there, is there some other reason for that sharp stabbing pain? Um, and, and unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you just have to start checking things off the box. And so you know, if it's never had mesh, you can still have that sharp stabbing pain and whether that's mm -hmm. our tissue around a local nerve or something like that, that can be difficult. Or it's pulling apart. You're, it's too tight and it's yep. trying to tear. So you're actually just feeling a tearing sensation of the abdominal wall. Yep. Yep. Which will may eventually lead to a hernia recurrence. Yeah. So those are all, all really good. And then what do you do with those? Do you, do you go straight to imaging first? Um, do you inject anything? I usually like to do imaging first. I yeah. think I think it's helpful to rule out those common causes of pain where where you can say, okay, we see that the hernias come back. So yeah. here's our algorithm for addressing that. So I, I like to start with some form of imaging just to give us some baseline. Um, and then for me, if that's negative uh, or doesn't give us a good answer for pain, again, getting a little better understanding of what's causing the pain. Sometimes we'll go partner with our multidisciplinary pain management team uh, who, you know, will we'll look at involvements of physical therapy and massage therapy and those sorts of stuff. Um, if my level of clinical concern for either it's come back or there's something wrong, say there was mesh put in, um, we'll, we'll consider a diagnostic laparoscopy or things like that on occasion. But, but again, that's, that's patient by patient, you know, specific and, and really a, an intense conversation that we have with everybody about why we're doing these different things. What's the likelihood we're going to find an answer and, and have something okay. to act upon. Yeah, exactly. I would say that if they had like a, a belly button hernia pair and, from the very beginning, it was like tight and, and burning and just never got better, just got worse. And probably it was maybe too tight of a repair without mesh. And that's just tearing apart. Imaging, especially like a CT scan with, with Valsalva, where you're pushing out to kind of recreate any small hernia is the first start. And then maybe injecting to see if it gets rid of the pain. It may or may not. Um, uh, you know, are this an obese patient where we're losing weight, maybe we'll take some of the tension off of the repair and reduce the pain. Um, sometimes you just have to, if, if the, the clinical story is good enough and the tear may be sm so small that, you know, they actually do need like mesh in there to take the tension off a, a primary repair. Um, sounds like she had injections, which didn't work and they took out her stitches recently and she's still in pain or he or she i'm not sure um i guess she because they're ovary questions but yeah these this is like where you can't just mess around with random doctor that's never done this before because you're going to get delaying care and maybe all they'll say is go to pain management and there may be something treatable 
Yeah. I think pain management is, is both is certainly beneficial. You know, we, we're pretty fortunate here that we have a good multidisciplinary team. And so when we send patients to pain management, it's not just they're going to give you narcotics to take all the time. You know, we work together with them to try different regional blocks. Uh, we work together with physical therapy, massage therapy, and, and multidisciplinary stuff. Um, really, the intention is not to just give you medications, but see if we can yeah. find other methods that will help with your pain. Yeah, totally agree. What I don't like is a surgeon who says, like, that doesn't follow up and then sends everything to pain management. And then the patient goes down this whole pain management trial to the point where they get like, oh, you need a pain stimulator or what's it called? Sp spinal stimulator or pain pump. And I'm just like, no, your hernia just recurred or something like right. that I can fix, right? Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's, I completely agree. And that's usually for when we, when we see them directly, it's rule yeah. out the common things that you can intervene upon yeah. um, before you go down the, the rabbit holes of uh, some of those other uh, alternatives. The next question is uh, relatively straightforward. Can you safely fixate mesh placed laparoscopically to the Cooper's ligament? Uh, I would say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, whether that's with, with sutures, um, you know, if you're doing things robotically, um, you know, if you're tacking, I don't, I don't necessarily put a tack directly into Cooper's if we use that sort of fixation, yes. Agreed. um, but usually just in the tissue above. And to be honest, you know, yeah. for, for smaller inguinal hernias, you know, there's good European data that you may not even need much fixation at all. If you have adequate mesh overlap, which I think is probably more critical than any fixation, you know, method right? yeah. getting an adequate repair and overlap. So um, I yeah. would say yes, um, but lots of variables like everything. There's a question about that. Um, it's a very specific thing, but let's do this question and then we'll do the next one. So the question is, I had a small recurrent, I think inguinal hernia yeah. due to flipping up of a mesh implanted 20 years ago. It was repaired using a 2.5 centimeter by one centimeter piece of ultra pro mesh to bridge the gap. That's like not even an inch. And I was going to say that is tiny. <laughs> That's like the, like the thumb, size of my thumb. Um, the new Ultra Pro mesh will suture to the original mesh, which had been fully incorporated. Is this an effective, appropriate, and safe way to treat this type of recurrence? Uh, I, I think we need a little bit more information to know for yes. sure, kind of like where the hernia was, uh, kind of how it recurred, what happened, those sorts of things to, to say for sure. I, Without knowing that information, it's a little bit hard to say as far as the safety and all that sort of stuff. But right. but as far that's as that's not effective. I would say it would not be effective. That would not be my first choice. I think that's yeah. a safe way to put it. And again, that goes back to the comment, you know, when when we feel mesh is appropriate, right? When we when we decide that mesh is appropriate for a patient, I think what's what's critical is to make sure that you're using again the right mesh that's the right size and the right indication. Uh, and I can't honestly say that I've ever put a 2.5 by one centimeter piece of mesh in anybody and, and felt that that was, you know, met all those requirements. Um, have you ever used a two and a half by one centimeter piece of mesh for anything? I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't remember either. It's pretty small. Um, okay, so let's let's break this down a bit. Um, what are your thoughts about mesh to mesh bridging? Like old mesh is there, and you just use a new mesh to bridge the recurrence on the side of the old mesh. So, so the way I talk to patients about this is I, I use the analogy of shingles. You talked about cars before I use shingles in this situation and that if you get mm -hmm. new shingles on your house, you know, most of the time they'll take the old shingles off before they start with new shingles. And so my preference in, in these situations is to try and take the old mesh out uh, yeah. and kind of start from scratch. There are certainly some again, some caveats to that statement, um, you know, is taking the old mesh out going to be more dangerous than leaving it in, uh, in that situation, if it's on or near critical blood vessels or different things like that, where taking the old mesh out may make you worse. Mm -hmm. Also where it was, you know, is it in between different muscle layers previously, we're now going to cause muscle trauma, trying to take all that old mesh right. out. Um, so, so there's certainly some, some situations where I will not, but my preference, if I can safely do it is to take the old mesh out before I put any sort of new mesh back in. Very good. So, um, the way I describe it is the way mesh works, once you put it in, it's not, a, it's not neutral. 
it starts an inflammatory reaction. And that reaction is what allows the mesh to kind of incorporate with the muscle. But 20 years later, that mesh is like a piece of paper. It, I can put a piece of paper against the wall. It's always going to fall. It's not going to stick, you know? Right. It's like an old sticky, you know, the, 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 the glue is gone. Right. Um, so the new mesh, however, will have that, will restart the process, right? The inflammatory process. But to think that like mesh is going to somehow stick to mesh or you can kind of force them to be together, I, I, I think is not an effective way of, of treating most. I, I do, I'm much I'm more of a purist like you are, and I take out the old mesh almost always and kind of put in the new mesh, or at least take it out where I where I need the old mesh, the new mesh to be, um, because it doesn't work otherwise. Yeah, I agree. Plastic is not going to heal in or you know. Uh, it doesn't grow into plastic. <laughs> plastic. Yep. Um, okay, so the other point of the question was. Yeah, but that first mesh was already, quote, fully integrated into the external oblique. Um, I take out groin mesh all the time. They're always fully integrated. Yep. I think that's an irrelevant kind of reasoning to do this patch approach. Well, what do you think? Yeah, again, I think it comes back to why you're going there. You yeah. know, but is, you know, if it's somebody who had, a say, an opening inguinal hernia repair done 20 years ago with mesh. Yeah. Um, did fine for 20 years and now has a small symptomatic recurrence or a symptomatic recurrence where, where it's not a mesh problem. It's not a pain problem. It's a recurrence problem. Um, I think in those situations, I'd consider going in minimally invasively and fixing it from exactly. the inside out and probably not touching the old mesh because if they're right. not having problems with it, um, you know, your risk for injury to the, if it's a male, the testicular vessels, the vas deferens, surrounding tissues, the, the risks of that happening don't outweigh the benefits uh, of taking it out. So, right. so I think in those situations, you know, I, I try to think of all, if it's a groin hernia, alternative methods for repair. Now, if it's somebody who's having pain and you think the mesh is, is one of the features or one of the culprits for it, mm -hmm. then I think that's a different situation. But if you're strictly operating for recurrence, um, then I think you have to, to decide are the risks and benefits uh, balanced out. Right, because the, the safest, most effective and appropriate, using the terms of this question, for hernia recurrence from an open surgery 20 years ago would be to go in laparoscopically and not do it the same way as the first one. Yeah, totally agree with that. All right, next question is um, related to what you were mentioning earlier. So in Europe, the syndrome of, quote, sports hernia or athletic pubalgia is at times treated by laparoscopically placed mesh in a Manchester repair fashion. I don't know if you're familiar with this term, but uh, Dr. Ali Sheen has termed the, the Manchester repair. It's basically a laparoscopic repair without fixation. Okay. Um, and sometimes using fiber and glue as your only fixation, but no mechanical fixation. In your opinion, is this a valid way to treat this? And how does it address the pubic plate instability associated with athletic pubalgia? Ooh. Right. So, yeah, this, this is a uh, yeah. I take back my technical comments. Told early. you. Um, so you know, I think that sports hernia, athletic pubalgia, whatever whatever kind of term you want to put on it, yeah. is a it's a difficult subject. In that, you know, some people are pure believers. Some people say mm -hmm. it's not a real thing. Some people say surgery from everybody. Some people say no surgery. Yeah. Um, so it really depends who you see and, and who you ask. And so my. Um, suggestion to patients in these situations is, you know, find somebody who does this a lot, you know, not somebody who's like, oh yeah, sure. I can, you know, I can put some mesh in there and see, uh, and get their input. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a balance. Uh, I certainly think that if you believe this is a muscular instability sort of thing as, mm -hmm. as the culprit of the pain, um, and you're trying to, to provide some strengthening or reinforcement to some of that stability. I think there is potential value in, in that sort of repair, but I think that's, that's where, again, it's important to see somebody who, who has expertise in this, who, who studies, who follows their patients. Um, I think those are all really important things, um, as you're looking for a surgeon to take care of this. Yeah. And, um, those that do a lot of athletic pubalgia, they're in two camps. One is that everything has to be done open and kind of reconstruct the, the uh, pelvic floor and, and the attachments of the rectus and adductor and so on. 
And then there are others that are like, no, we can do this retro muscularly, like just put in a, a mesh that can kind of support and take tension off the other muscles. But my, I feel that a lot of times those are just people that have hernias <laughs> and it is not really a, a athletic pubalgia. Yep. And it's therefore the hernia repair works. I don't know. I, I haven't, I haven't, I'm not in either camp. Yeah, and I think it can even go the other way in that there's patients who have athletic pubalgia who are told they have a hernia yeah, and get, get surgery in one form or another and still have their pain syndrome. And now all of a sudden, then you're left talking about like, well, wait, is it the mesh that's causing it the pain? Was it pain? Was it the pain you had before surgery? Yeah. Uh, and so that's where they can get really challenging. Okay, this question is a good one because I think it'll give some good um, kind of you know, addressing some misinformation that's out there. So the question is this, my hernia recurrence manifested itself 25 years after my plug and patch. So we already talked about plug and patch. It was very common in the, I would say very late nineties, early two thousands. That's when it kind of peaked and then we, people still do it. Yep. Also, I have a feeling that some problems that arise never get attributed to mesh when they should. All the link is the undoubtedly hard to find in many cases. For example, I have a tumor in the neck of my bladder. And after studying the literature, I learned that there are a number of cases where shards of decomposing mesh can cross anatomical planes and even end up in the bladder. And that sometimes these, quote, growths are the result of calcifications building up around the irritant, which in this case is the shard of the mesh. Do you want to address this? <laughs> um, I think they make a very good comment in that and that statement in that it's a hard thing to to isolate and differentiate you know on one patient or another did that happen did that not happen and so um i i think it can be very difficult to know for sure in one patient versus another to clearly say oh it's this microscopic fiber of mesh that has or has not migrated and so i think just as hard as it is to prove it it's also probably equally as hard to definitively say nope, this didn't have anything to do with it at all. Right. And so I think that that it's a challenging situation. And I don't have a good answer for that, to be honest, to say like, yes, no. Um, but I think it's it's a it's a difficult situation. And, and certainly there are things that happen that we just, we can't explain. No matter how much we'd like to, to look it up in a textbook or in a paper and say, oh, it's, you know, this is why this happened. This is why your hernia came yeah. This is why you have a tumor. Um, yeah. it can be very difficult to put any sort of definitive answer on it. So there's a lot of talk online about mesh migration and it really comes out of the lawsuits. Yep. Um, but uh, can you address, do all meshes migrate? The short answer is no, but <laughs> can yeah. you explain no, I... mesh migration and like why people are so hung up on like, oh, my mesh migrated and it's, I have migration. What if I have migration of the mesh? I, I think it, it, so I agree. Does all mesh migrate? Not necessarily. I think it really comes down to the first thing you need to answer is what does migration mean to you? Yeah. Because what migration means to me may be different than what a patient who says my mesh migrated, what that means to them or another physician or anybody. So I think that's an important definition to put out. So when I hear migrate, Mm -hmm. I think of it's moved, it's come loose and now it's migrated to someplace else. And so yeah. can that happen? Yes. Does all mesh migrate? No. Right. Um, you know, if, if somebody has a recurrent hernia, for example, and it recurs off the side of the mesh, you know, their hernia was here, they put a mesh in like this, and now they have a recurrence off the side of the mesh. Yeah. I don't think that's because the mesh, you know, had little feet and migrated off to the side, I think it comes down to the characteristics of the hernia repair and the patient characteristics and all that sort of stuff. So in that situation, I would say that's not a mesh migration problem. You know, there's multiple factors. We yeah. why or why not that hernia may have come back. You know, when I, the things I really were about migration is yes, mesh that's either broken loose from the abdominal wall of its attachments or wasn't adequately attached to begin with, whether that's a plug, or a or ventral hernia mesh, and now it's located someplace else. Um, that's what I think of for migration. Yeah, I think the term migration was was mostly used with the plug. We keep bringing up yep. the plug this hour, um, but the plug and patch. And if people were not fixing the mesh in at least three areas, 
it would flip around and or move this whole issue of migration erosion penetration um, the way that plug was depending on where it was placed and how it was placed there were situations when it eroded into bladder it eroded into the, to the intestines and it migrated was found like somewhere else like deeper in the pelvis than where it was originally placed I don't know that most other flat meshes migrate. They can fold, they can, they can shift maybe, yep. but to migrate, like actually physically move to a different part of the body. Um, I think that's classically a mesh plug issue. Yep. Um, and then in terms of these shards, I don't know about sh shards. I don't know anything about shards like making its way into another tissue plane that's not something that that um, we experience or see yeah I, I feel like a lot of this discussion sometimes is in in forums and yep. they become like real but like if you ask someone who does it for a living we're like no that doesn't happen yeah I, I agree I, I think can can we see mesh erosion in the tissue sure we can see yes. that again not common, but we can see that. But to have these microscopic pieces of it migrate and uh, and other places, it's 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 just hard to prove. Uh, it's very very hard to prove. Yeah. What are your thoughts on hybrid mesh? So part synthetic, part absorbable by logic. Um, I think you know the argument for those is you get the best of both worlds right you can have some material and then it goes away you get the benefits of biologic and you get the benefits of permanent synthetics but i think the flip side of that is you get some of the downsides of both right you know you you, you have permanent material that's left forever so is there value over using a traditional just permanent material to begin with um and same thing with some of the different biologic materials that we know whether it's or in growth or, yeah. or you know, poor fluid penetration or things like that. So, so I think the idea was you get the benefits of both, but I think the trade-off is you get some of the downsides of both. So it's not a common part of my practice um, for those reasons. Okay, here's another question for you. Uh, for incisional hernia patients, are there any new studies aimed at improving wound healing to the point that, that non-absorbable permanent materials and the patient's own long-term immune system activation can come with them th that come with with these non-absorbable permanent materials um, can be avoided while minimizing recurrence rates at the same time. So he's talking about can you is there a mesh or are, are there meshes out there potentially in the future where you're putting it in there, it will heal without necessarily messing up someone's like inflammatory response or autoimmune response um, risk and not recur. Yeah, you know, I think- I, I um, deal with much. Yeah, I, I don't know of any active studies, but I think it's a really interesting question. And, and so this goes back to what I said at the beginning, kind of these different styles of meshes and some of the, the absorbable ones that are, yeah. are more prevalent now. And, and there's a big push of saying like, well, we should use those for the high risk patients, whether it's concerns for infection because of smoking or obesity or diabetes. Yeah. So there's been a big push like those patients that are at high risk for infection, which is one of the things we worry about with mesh should have non-permanent mesh. Fine. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a whole nother subgroup of patients where those actually may be beneficial. And that may be the overall healthy patient who's a normal BMI who, who will probably heal yeah, but needs some some temporary support and reinforcement to get them over the healing learning curve. And so so I do think it's something that as a as a practice, as a group, um, we probably need to start looking in and that, you, you know, should we start using non permanent meshes in the healthy patients and the mid sized hernias, um, as opposed to saying, oh, well, they're at low risk, so we'll just use permanent material. Um, but I don't, I don't know any of those active studies going on right now. Yeah, I, I, I'm not there yet. I don't know that um, we have enough data to support using absorbable products, whether synthetic or biologic, as like standard of care. Yep. You know, I don't know how you feel about that. I, I, I agree. Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of things to take into consideration there. Not that cost should be a factor that decides the care we provide patients, but it's it's part of the whole equation. So knowing that some of these meshes can cost tens of times 
yeah. more than other mesh options, more, I think is an important yeah. part as we, we try to be good stewards of healthcare costs, especially if there's no clear clinical benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's an important conversation to have with patients. And again, I, I go back to that term I used earlier and I use a lot as goals. Like, what are your goals for the operation? Mm -hmm. You know, and what are the risks of different mesh choices? Some people who maybe had a mesh infection in the past for whatever reason, and they're now come back down the road, you know, they may say, listen, I, I would rather take a higher risk for my hernia to come back yeah. if I had a lower risk for another mesh infection. And you may get another right. patient who's had like three repairs and three recurrences. And they're like, listen, I just do what's going to give me the best long-term repair. That's the risk that's more important to me or the benefit that's more important to me. So that's where goals of the operation are different for everybody. And so it's yeah. not a universal statement. Yeah. It's like the car analogy, you know, do you need a car to take your kids to school or for grocery shopping or off-roading or you know, to have fun on the weekend um, as a two-seater, like, you know, it's, I can't say like there's one perfect car, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right? It all depends yeah. on, on the person. Um, so what do you think we we're moving towards? You think, that, are we moving towards less synthetic permanent mesh? Are we moving towards less inflammatory um, components to the mesh? What do you think we're moving towards? I think it's, again, it's a pendulum swing. And I think oh. it, it's, it's different for, for every hernia. It's different for every patient uh, along the way. So I, I think um, as we get a better understanding of mesh and how we use it, you know, we'll find patients that maybe don't need permanent synthetic mesh that we historically would have just said, oh, here's a mesh we have, we're going to use it. Um, yeah. But I think that, that that is still very much in its infancy, uh, as you mentioned uh, just recently. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't envision permanent mesh going away. Yeah. I think there are patients that that clearly provides the best clinical benefit for them based off of their hernia and their characteristics and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think we'll probably see less of the traditional biologics as we've always kind of known them. Uh, yes. Again, as we learn a little bit more about how meshes interact in the body. Um, but I think a lot that's changed is again, that, that how we use it part, uh, just as much as the kind of mesh we use um, for hopefully the, the benefit of patients. You know, I go back to the year 2002, I think, 2002, 2003. Yeah, yeah, 2002. And I had this lady, she had like 15 hernia repairs and then massive infections, massive and obese. And it was just a horrible situation where I had to take out all the infected mesh. And I don't know how wide her defect was. It was well over 20 centimeters. And she was obese lady and diabetic. And I'm like, how am I supposed to put her back together again with infection, yep. with this huge, I couldn't close her. There's no way. And at the time I worked at the county hospital. So we were a big burn center. So we had access to alloderm, like there was no tomorrow. It was yeah. like, <laughs> we we're probably the world's largest user of alloderm, mostly as a cadaveric skin replacement for burn victims. Yeah, yeah but I had access to a lot of alloderm. And back then, you don't remember this because you were too young, four by six, so, seven, yeah, that piece was the largest pictures. piece available. I sewed, and I'm very embarrassed to say this, but you know, I think I sewed like 20 pieces together. Not joking. She was like a, like a quilt, like a patchwork. Yep. That said, she closed no more infection, was able to go home. She was in and out of the hospital for like three years before that. Um, with it with infections that no one would try, would try and I saw her like I want to say three years later where supposedly all that alloderm is gone and all she has is like skin <laughs> yeah, yeah. but she was morbidly obese and she didn't look bad she didn't look like she had like a massive problem um but in retrospect I don't know what else I would have done but in retrospect uh that was not the right thing you know to to use that much biologic oh oh and I couldn't close skin so I, I vacked it she would she grew <laughs> she grew tissue over it uh, so I was able to watch alloderm become vascular and yeah. grow blood vessels it was the most unique experience ever um we just don't do that anymore you know no. 
we don't overuse biologics like that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I think in, in that infections, the, the, the setting of either active infection or past infection really changes the discussion uh, a lot, especially if it's MRSA. And, and, you know, for that patient, so they may have a recurrent hernia, but, but you fixed the problem that they came in with. There were chronic infection in and out of the hospital, all that sort of stuff. So that's, I think, you, you know, if you think about what your goals were for walking out of the operating room on that day, you knew you weren't going to give them a permanent hernia repair. Yeah. Um, or maybe at that time we thought the biologics would be a permanent. Yeah. At that time repair. we but, thought whatever you sew it to, it'll be that. You sew right. it to fascia, it'll be fascia. Yeah. It just turns into fascia. But yeah, nowadays we know work. like yeah. that's not the case, but that, that wasn't what you were trying to accomplish for that. We so didn't like, know back then. We didn't know back then. There's a comment right now where someone's like really unhappy that we're saying a lot of, we don't know. And I don't know. And we're not talking in very definitive statements like this is the right mesh, this is good, that's bad. And you know, that's the reality. I know patients want us to be able to give them definitive question answers, but listen, I thought I was doing the best thing for this lady. And maybe I did because she no longer had infections, you know, this is 20 years ago. But I know so much more now. Yep. And I many of the patients I treated back in 2002, I would not do the same. Right. in 2020. Well, and I think to, to the commenter's point, it's a little bit hard in these non-specific scenarios to say like, here's the right one. But I, I, and I don't want to speak for you, but I would say for most patients, when we see them one off, like we will leave the office visit with a pretty definitive plan and a very definitive discussion about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and yeah. those sorts of things. So on a, on a patient by patient basis, I, I feel very confident and telling them what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. I may not have the, all the answers, but I'll be able to give them a definitive plan. But in, but in these general scenarios, there's so many things that you just can't, can't take into consideration uh, that make it hard to say it, you know, the best mesh is whatever yeah. brand you want to say. Yeah. We don't know is polypropylene better or polyester is there, there's PVDF in Europe that we don't have here. Is that a better implant use um we just discussed hybrid meshes and synthetic absorbables and biologic absorbables like there are all these ranges of products there's no proof that there any one is like superior we know some don't work as well as others but right. maybe for one patient the one that doesn't work as well is actually the better choice yep. you know yep yeah i okay. think um People who feel that medicine is like an exact science are very pissed off <laughs> when we can't give them like definitive answers for things because it they think it makes us look like wishy-washy, like we don't know what we're talking about, but it's actually the opposite. The, the surgeon that is like knows everything exactly is usually the one that under, like doesn't see the full picture. No, I, and and I, I describe that to patients and some of these really complex things is, and, and first of all, I apologize, right, to being wishy-washy because sometimes you are, but <laughs> but that's what I say. It's the art of surgery much more than the science of surgery. And that's where you want somebody who has the experience and has seen lots of things to be able to make adjustments. You know, you get in the operating room and you see something that's different, you know, all of a sudden you need a screw and all you have is a hammer. Yeah, um, that's not ideal. So you want somebody who's able to adjust to different situations as they arise throughout the course of an operation. Yeah, and we're we're all watching what's happening in Europe. So many companies um, cannot sell any of their meshes in Europe, and they're either bankrupt or they have just decided that they're just never going to enter the European market, which in some ways is not good for patient care because you're reducing innovation and. Yep. Uh, and so on. So I don't want that to happen in the United States necessarily, but you know we all speak with companies and and um, uh, talk about the future and so on. And uh, many of them are like, we're just not going to be in Europe. Our mesh will not be in Europe, and they have no ambitions because it's it, at the end of the day they are for profit companies, yep. and there's no non profit mesh company out there. Um, so you know it is what it is. Yeah, I agree. All right. I think I answered a lot of these questions. We had some other comments, but I'm going to um, thank you for your time because yeah. it's been great. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. I haven't um, been able to like to see you and interact with you for so long because of, I guess, COVID and meetings and this and that. So 
I'm always grateful when I can see my friends and colleagues uh, at least virtually like this and kind of yep. talk about things we like to talk about and, and so on. So thank yep. you very much for your time. I do really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And, you know, thanks for all the questions and comments along the way. It certainly makes the discussion very insightful. Um, thanks. And fun. Every week. We do this every week. I love it. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you for joining me on Hernia Talk Live. This concludes our 109th episode. Can you oh. believe that? Of Hernia Talk Live Q&A. I'm Dr. Sharin Tofai. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey Blotnick. You can follow him at Jeff Blotnick on Twitter. And um, stay tuned to watch this and share it with your friends uh, on my YouTube channel. And thanks everyone for joining me. And thank you again for your time. Bye. Take care.